evening. Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Special Program City Series. Tonight, it is our great honor to present Field to Frog Fashion Lessons from the Slow Food Movement. Tonight's discussion will focus on the slow food movement and the intersections between its practices and fashion. Summer Rain Oaks, who is Director of Marketing at Foodstand, will be the moderator. Our panelists are Kiki Adami, founder of Visionizer, Richard McCarthy, Executive Director of Slow Food USA, and fashion designer Jusara Lee. I want to especially thank Jusara for being such a close friend of the museum at FIT and for making tonight happen. Please join me in welcoming Summer, Kiki, Richard, and Jusara. Thanks, guys. Welcome, and uh, thank you for attending. So just to keep going, because this is a conversation that is both broad and deep, we could probably do a panel just on slow food or just on slow fashion, but instead we're looking at the um, intersection of the two, which is intensely fascinating, and I don't know if there's been another panel kind of like it. So. Um, we will be rifling through some questions. You'll see some slides as well. And uh, I wanted to give you our Twitter handles up there. And I made up one of those hashtags, so if people wanted to see what people are tweeting afterwards, you could do it. But quite honestly, if you're engaged and you don't want to tweet, don't go for it, because it could also be pretty distracting. I'm just uh, going to give a little bit of a, an overview of who everyone is here. Kiki Adami, right there, is the founder of Veganizer. It's a company that flips omnivore restaurants 180 degrees from omnivore to vegan. In the next year, there will be franchises opening up in Sydney, London, SF, and LA. Congrats, that's pretty big. She was the first person to veganize a restaurant here in, the New, York, in New York City back in 2013, and she is a consultant for restaurants worldwide. She's also a Philly native. You have a friend in Pennsylvania. Scranton, and segued to Argentina. Did you actually do it on a segue? <laughs> Sorry. <Sort> segued, <laughs> segued to Argentina for three years where she learned the art of raw food under chef Diego Castro. Jasara, just to my left, is a native of Brazil, of Korean heritage, who moved to New York City back in 1987 to study at, guess what, FIT. She has been in business since 1991, designing collections under her signature label for the likes of Barney's and Bergdorf Goodman. And for the past 15 years, her focus has been on locally produced, hand-tailored, custom-made clothes. And Richard McCarthy, I'll let you guess who he is, uh, is the executive director for Slow Food USA, the American wing of the global food organization devoted to food that is good, clean, and fair for all. Having spent 20 plus years in the food movement, Richard's work has spanned the hyper-local reinvention of food traditions and systems post-Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, the development of farmers markets measurement tools, and public advocacy for innovative policies in the last two farm bills. Good luck on the next one. Uh, a vegetarian, one of the campaigns he has launched at Slow Food is Slow Meat. So I've asked our panelists today to say something about themselves, but I asked them to do it in either haiku or limerick form. <laughs> so Jusara, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. Um, I wanna just really thank uh, Tanya and uh, Valerie for accepting this idea of like paralleling slow fashion and slow food. Um, I am so glad to be here from being a student to be a panelist. I feel like I made it. <laughs> and my haiku is, Jusara lives small, bike or plane, I'm no angel, grateful for it all. Handmade and tailored, uh, custom made, slow me down, a preservator. So I misinterpreted the assignment. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be about our business. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. So uh, this is about Veganizer. 
and uh, it's a limerick. Veganizer NYC, flipping businesses to be free from the animals we love, saving the earth and the air above, animals freed and clients make money. You're on the hot seat, Richard. Okay, it's a very <laughs> modest little haiku. Uh, the future is waged daily, field to fork, with joy and not sadness. I like it. I love it. You guys are good. <laughs> so I'm just going to start with a little quote. And um, this is just to give us a sense of a more utopian world, if you will. Um, and it basically says, if farming were meant to feed people, then we would have no hunger. And if clothing was meant to be loved, then we would have little waste. And this is just to give us a sense of thought that we have everything in our power to be able to feed people who are hungry, um, good and nutritious food, and we have everything in our power to create fashion that is loved and to create no waste or little waste within fashion. Um, but it's that kind of political and economic climate that we work in, uh, and these are some of the topics that make it so complex. So, again, this, this, uh, this whole panel is going to be quite broad and deep, so I've structured it into six different categories of foundational elements, society, culture, and citizens' role, growing production and manufacturing, politics, which is a big one, obviously, recycling, and final thoughts. We might not get through all of them, but we will have time for questions afterwards. So getting right to it, let's cover the basics to start. Slow fashion and slow food. What do these terms refer to, and what's the origin of both words and the movement? So, Richard, why don't we start? Why don't you start us off with slow food? Okay. Well, the origins come back to Italy when McDonald's landed on the shores of Italy, and specifically at the uh, foot of the Spanish Steps, and Italian political, cultural, uh, gastronomic activists said enough, enough with this fast food, and, and sought not so much to burn down the McDonald's, but to stage street parties, penne pasta street parties, to celebrate the slow foods. And this is the biodiversity, the sense of food as community, in essence reclaiming food from the captains of industry who are interested in scale and efficiency and the fact that we should all be eating the same food in the same manner, often alone, and reclaiming that in a very creative, um, uh, constructive fashion where we begin to grow this alternative world within the shell of this horrible fast food one. And this has taken shape now all over the world in 160 countries. In the US, we have 150 chapters of volunteer leaders and activists and farmers and chefs and fishers who are growing community through food. And I think the things that we now see today are, are both a critique of the industrial food system and its homogeneity and its dreariness, its blandness. Um, and there are great desires that it shares with fashion to transform the industrial system, create greater transparency and engagement and, 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 and participation. But more importantly, I think, is to grow an alternative, an alternative that now is part of our, the revolution of everyday life, whether it's food trucks, farmers markets, CSAs, school gardens. Um, the fact that food is, has been reclaimed from those who want food as fuel, we now are able, and I think are, are, are sort of liberated to think of food as an asset, a cultural asset, something that defines who we are it's very intimate, like fashion. It's what we put inside our bodies. It's an expression of who we are. And most importantly, from this sense of joy that we reclaim with food, it is an incredible opportunity to serve the role as a bridge, uh, to bridge relationships with other people. And I think especially in the current political context between urban and rural, between supply and demand, and to create relationships that are authentic. Jasara, what about slow fashion? 
Um, so slow fashion was really a term that exists as an antithesis to fast fashion and everything that it represents. So it questions the, um, the advantages of quality over quantity. And uh, it also questions the, our, our relationship with, with time in this economical system that we live. Time is attached to a value, uh, a currency. So we, we work full time, over time, part time. We are paid by the hour. So in, in, in slow fashion is, is sort of like a, of like a a definition of, of going through the hurdles of doing things in a way where you don't compromise quality, you don't compromise all the more important core values in our society as opposed to just, you know, for, for the sake of making things faster, especially on the, the, on the, the level of, of quantity. So, you know, examples would be people that, uh, you know, they, they shear sheep in the farms to create, to produce wool. They have to do it so fast because they want to make the extra buck and whatnot, and they end up cutting the sheep's parts, like their ears, <laughs> their testicles. Uh, we don't want to make time to eat, so we end up resorting to fast food that has no nutrient values, and there's not there's not that ceremony of making and, and, and eating well. Uh, in a factory, they are pressed with time to make things you know, as fast as possible, so that's where we have problems where mistakes and accidents happen. Um, so yeah, so slow fashion it really represents these, these core values that are, should be put in place before fast everything, convenience, so yeah. Great, thank you. And Kiki, how does the slow food movement intersect with the vegan movement, and are there any conflicting elements of it as well? So I didn't know how he was going to answer that question, um, and I was prepared to battle you. <laughs> but I actually agree with you on a lot of points. Um, from what I hear you saying, what the slow food movement means is it's a, you don't see it as a calorie food, you don't see it as a trend, you don't see it as a diet. It's a cultural stance and a counter offer to our current perspective on what food serves for people today. It's a counter offer. And just to be clear from the get-go, if you could give me the slide, there's the word vegan perhaps uh, is a bad word to some of you, right? We think of PETA, we think of militant vegans, uh, but the truth is, is that it is a very, very gray type of movement. It's not black and white, there's many forms. There's nutritional vegans, there is ethical vegans, there's environmentalist vegans, um, there's all types of vegans, and it depends on whatever your intention is, is how you approach your personal veganism. I could stand here today as an ethical vegan and not talk about food once. So for the sake of today's argument, I'm going to talk to you all from a nutritional food vegan stance. And in that perspective, uh, we overlap in a lot of ways. Um, we too see food as something that is cultural. We too want to offer a counter offer that is basically, we are in a health food crisis in the US and we have obesity in most children, unfortunately, 80% of our nation is obese. We spend millions of dollars on healthcare every single year um, for food-related sicknesses, and it's very much a cat and mouse type of situation we have going on with our food system, our health system, our environmental system. There's also a complete lack of connection between food and the farmer, and I think that's a, lot, a big bridge you're trying to build. So when I grew up, I thought that chicken came from the frozen section of the, of, the, of the grocery store. There was no connection. And if I had had someone from the slow food movement come to me and say, hey, there was a farmer who worked really hard to cultivate that land, it would have been a lot more important to me. Where we differ, I think, is perhaps uh, you honor food as culture and, uh, I, uh, and we perhaps have the same root of 
food is much more than a calorie and it needs to be quality over quantity, I do think that the root of what real food may be differed. For example, you used Italy, uh, the pastas, uh, the cultures, the food trucks. In my opinion, getting back to the roots of what real food and the ultimate slow food is if you get hungry, you're walking through the forest, you pull a pear off a tree. That to me is real slow food. Um, so we overlap in many ways, um, and I think that the ultimate difference is, is just we cut animals out of our idea of what real slow food is. Thank you for that. Now, I took a look in the news as to when slow fashion, the term slow fashion actually popped up first, and it was back in 2007, yeah, 2006, 2007, and uh, it was, you know, before that time we were really talking about fashion more as green, eco, ethical, we still do that today as well. Um, but it wasn't until the following year, 2008, when the, world, uh, the word slow uh, fashion really started to emerge in the press. Uh, consequently, three years after the first term of fast fashion. Uh, now, now we see more of a proliferation of slow fashion versus green, and I'm wondering why you think that is, Jusara. Um. Okay, there are a lot of overlapping aspects between green, eco, ethical, and slow. I think, you know, th th those being local production, the avoidance of chemicals, you would choose organically produced cotton as opposed to non-organic, and that kind of thing. But, Slow fashion, I think it takes a step a little further because it actually also promotes and, and engages, disengages you actually from, from the, this fixation that we have on, on money as the bottom line, as like the everything, and the scale. So you can still be eco and, 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 know, and make things the way we think is the least harmful for the environment, but you kind of like let go the idea of making into a big scale production for the sake of making a lot of money. And you actually go into other values that I mentioned before, which are quality and, and, and you know, going to, inter interacting with the people that are actually making the things that you do in a, on a personal level. And, and, and getting educated on how the process of, of manufacturing actually is. So those are things that I, I think they are part of, of the, 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 the definition of slow fashion that doesn't necessarily spill into eco and, and green. I mean, you can, there is still uh, mass produced companies that utilize organic, organically grown cotton. So, but right. that would and they could be considered Maybe eco, green or eco, exactly, but not, but not slow. slow fashion. Right. Yes, uh, and I, I think that's really the core core point. Is as we started to see more and more production come forth from fashion, there had to be another way to kind of differentiate from that. Um, do you think consumers kind of understand that though? Like, if I said slow fashion, what like what would come to mind in your most unbiased opinion? Uh, I think because the word slow means so many things, it's, it's, it kind of gets the, the idea across pretty fast. And it basically, it is very much derivative of the word. It is slowing down consumption. It is slowing down the scale of production. So it, it's a lot of information for the final consumer to grasp. But I think as, as long as one understands that we need to be engaged in, in how things are produced and how much we're taking from, from the environment and what we are producing in, in, in return, which is just a lot of garbage, it doesn't really matter what you call it. And, uh, and it, the most important thing is that you just think and, and you act responsibly as a consumer. Richard, how about you? I'm just going to throw that question out to you in, in case of slow food. Really, if you, if you took this to you know, middle America, what would, what would they say? What, what comes to mind in consumers' minds when you say slow food? Crock-pot, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> at one level, certainly. I mean, how ready are people, how familiar are they 
you know, with the term. Although, quite honestly, slow food, the opposite of fast food, does make some sense in the way that I think slow fashion begins to shift the narrative, the culture shift away from our obsession with scale and speed and extracting wealth from places rather than generating wealth and in a manner where we measure success differently. And, and one of the problems with the, the sort of ecological or environmental lens of trying to reform food or fashion is that it's a very technocratic approach. What, what measures can we put in place to still pump out the same volume and, and maybe reduce our ecological footprint but still ultimately maintain an industrial scale that wants you to consume as quickly as possible so that you buy more and more and more, really sort of really questioning the consumer ethos, the consumer society, as opposed to being a conserver society, which Yasara describes, is maybe we do consume less, purchase less, use it longer. Um, that is like so counter-American post-World War II, where we have to where we measure our success by how many things we have. Um, now that can be a very boutique conversation that you have to find the right place in which to have that discussion without sounding like, you know, sort of a ivory tower elitist. Um, but I think the interesting thing about food and, and, and our clothing is that these are very intimate things, decisions that we make as individual consumers clearly inspired or, 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 or steered towards certain consumption patterns. But these are decisions we make about ourselves that says things about ourselves. And increasingly, consumers, citizens of this earth, are beginning to ask the questions of why. Why more? Why every season I need something new? Um, the, the, the benefit of food is that we do eat and purchase food. We eat every day, we purchase food regularly. Um, with clothing, it's not that the transaction isn't as frequent, but it still is uh, something that we make as, as individual decisions as well as group decisions in, in when you think of policy. And I think that you had a slide, and it's a, I believe it's a butcher. Oops. Um, is this part of your slow meat? This would part? be part of slow meat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so just explain slow meat to me very quickly. Well, the sort of at the core of the tyranny of cheap food is this rush to scale and confinement of animals on land, confinement of our palates of certain breeds raised in certain ways. This is actually a, um, uh, a bison that's been fabricated from some of the, you know, the, the uh, grass-fed bison in, in Colorado. Um, it's a very grisly, intimate issue of, you know, how you, you butcher an animal. Um, but it does speak to the very issue we don't see, which is that most of the decisions that are made in the food we eat, the clothes we wear, are obscured from us. We don't get to see what happens. Um, that was the value of bringing butchers and, f and ranchers and animal welfare advocates to begin to develop an agenda around better meat, meat, animals that are raised um, under humane conditions until they're killed and slaughtered, um, but also less meat. We eat way too much meat. The rush to GMOs and chemical inputs is all about producing grains to feed animals so that we can consume vast amounts of cheap meat. And um, these questions are beginning to raise uh, to the point of being critical mass questions. So I think until we begin to address the question of how much meat we, we, we consume and what are the policies behind that, we cannot begin to liberate ourselves from really transforming our food system and our relationship with food. Kiki, what do you think about Richard's statements? Um, I mean, this is such a broad topic. The rabbit hole really does go so deep and you started to touch on to that. Um, and you had that photo, and I had mentioned earlier that I didn't know where a chicken came from. Mm. I thought it came from the frozen food section. And there's actually a slide up there with Jamie Oliver, if you wanna go back to that. He went into a classroom of first graders and started pulling out vegetables. And the f they didn't know what they were. They didn't know what they were called. And that's huge. How can you not know 
and you know, in retrospect, you know, it's always 2020. They knew what ketchup was, they but didn't, they didn't know it they came knew from what a tomato. Ketchup was. <laughs> but like you said, there's a huge disconnect that we, there's a big slide over our eyes as to how things get onto our plate. And even in fashion, like I had no, at the end of the day, a plate of food is made out of a recipe of ingredients and a shirt on your back is made out of a recipe of ingredients. And somewhere along that, you know, recipe, there was middlemen working those crops, putting together that raw material or putting together that dish. And we have to kind of delete that, that shield over our eyes as to how these things came to be. And, you know, we're very fortunate because we have Target and we have Walmart and things just magically appear on shelves and we never question how they got there and why they're so cheap. And so, thank God for YouTube, thank God for people like you, thank God for Vimeo, because there's a lot of people starting to reveal these things that we've never had access to, basically, until the last 20 years. When people, first it was books, but now it's YouTube, and it's, you know, the, the information is really getting out of there, getting out there into the public eye, and people are enraged, frankly, because... It's a, hum it's a stance on human rights. People are affected by it. It's a stance on animal rights. It's a stance on environmental rights. Environmental rights. Environmentalism. So um, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> so moving on, um, fashion and food has really always, throughout history, been a mark of social class. So if you looked at colonial trade driven by like spice, the spice trade, for instance, um, the, the murdering or the kind of moving into areas just to feed the coffers of the king. Um, same thing with fashion. Fashion really started out of dressing for the king and the, the courtiers. And so it was, it was this mark of social class. And we do see it now still because as you said earlier, Richard, we, we really identify with the, the food that we eat. Um, and it, it might be a little bit more insidious now, whether it's on our social media or, you know, I only drink juice or green juice or however it is, there is a mark of class. So in the age where we have social movements like a Black Lives Matter, high rates of diabetes with higher rates of diabetes with people and people of color, even arguably, you know, Trump's whole message was for the common man getting work back in there. So in this age of social movements like that, how can we bring slow fashion and slow food concepts into the reality that is not largely into the affluent white communities? So um, this is a big concept, so I'm gonna give uh, Richard the, the, roll the dice over to Richard first. Okay. Well, certainly, To begin with, the, the existing paradigm has very little room for points of entry to change it. And one of the places for food where there has been a point of entry to make change, to begin to value food differently, to value the dignity of the labor or the ingenuity of the farmer and the produce or the chef, has been the chef. And the chefs that are the least price point sensitive are certainly higher end white tablecloth chefs. And their restaurants are the ones that began to, at the very same moment, um, as we discovered the, the rock star chef, the television chef, they became incredibly powerful influencers and created moments that were maybe market moments as well as movement moments and created trends. And you, you see this sort of fetish fetishizing trends of, you know, whether it's a particular type of juice or kale suddenly becomes a national sensation. Um, you know, you do dive into this sort of fetish moments that, that may say more about who I am and what class I'm in and what neighborhood and, and so forth. But what that is beginning to do is popularizing ideas. And there were key other moments where we, we, we found weakness in the system. And I think certainly the school garden and the school lunch is one of those that begins to transform everyday life, ordinary kids, access and understanding to food so that they can begin to value food differently. Um, I think we'll see what the impact that is five, 10, 15 years from now, as these ideas move from the margins and, to, and begin to become um, valued by everyone, food being something that isn't just 
high-end food that we should wait for it to work its way down and trickle down into, you know, Main Street cooking and, and Walmart. Um, but this new recognition, and I think it is sort of the rise of the, the knowledge, uh, the intrinsic knowledge, traditional knowledge of peasant cooking. Is food becoming much simpler and recognizing that traditional knowledge is within our reach. Beans and rice is something that feeds the world and is interesting. It is not, you know, as we've been told, something that you sort of marginalize as uninteresting. The, the sort of cultural colonialism of packaged food is the problem. And it's also the problem when we think of uh, chronic diseases that also affect those who are most vulnerable. So programs around schools, school lunch, uh, uh, incentive programs that incentivize healthy food, there are some instruments there in the market as well as government instruments to begin to transform the behavior. But the transformation is not the transformation of you who are vulnerable eat badly and it's your fault and you're, 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 you're not well informed. We're all trying to navigate these crazy food quandaries that we're in. And we're looking for places that educate us so that we have better navigation through these tricky choices. Um, but I think certainly the schools, the farmers markets have been incredibly popularizing mechanisms beyond just the white tablecloth. It also is really nice to see that we have SNAP benefits here in the city to actually accept that in the, in the green markets here. And it, and it took years yeah. because EBT was introduced by USDA in 1996 and they didn't think about farmers markets mm -hmm. because why would we care about farmers markets? They weren't supposed to exist anymore. And it was the innovation on the ground of farmers market organizers finding a way to cross that digital divide to not only, to just be able to accept them, but it was also the recognition, and I think this speaks to what Yusara was saying earlier about scale, the recognition that in farmers markets, if you wanna move vast volumes of vegetables, produce, you're not gonna do it in farmer's markets. There are many more highly efficient, almost kind of Stalinist bureaucratic mechanisms to move vast volumes of produce. But there aren't mechanisms more effective to move produce in a manner that educates people. And it's because of the architecture of markets being multiple vendors who you talk to, you learn from, you bump into people while you queue up. These are places where you learn. And this was not designed by some policy expert. It was designed by communities rallying around the desire to have different meaningful relationships around food. So it is extraordinary that we have SNAP at farmers markets, now USDA policies that um, reward vulnerable consumers to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, but it has come out of the ingenuity of communities saying, I want something different than the world we've been handed. Jusara, did you want something about um, um, I think the the lunch uh, in school program that Alice in you know Alice waters Alex waters mm -hmm. in, yeah he she she's still working on is incredible effective and um, and there is you know speaking of of less affluent communities I mean there's a great story and there is this guy named Ron Finlay he was actually at a conference at the slow food big Terra Madre event in Italy with Alice. And, and it was incredible because he comes from the poorest area in Los Angeles. And he said he had to drive 45 minutes to get a fresh tomato or fresh anything because everything that was available around him was fat, fast food, all you know, processed. So he decided to plant a vegetable garden in front of his place in this little dirt of, uh, dirty patch of land, and then a neighbor got upset, and he got in trouble with the authorities, but uh, he had the activists on his side, and he made, he, he, he made a big deal out of it, and, and guess what? I mean, I think there are some slides of it. That's, yeah, that's his place now. This was all like just dry land. So there are ways, because simple, I mean, it can be so simple to just have a, a kitchen garden in a little patch of land that is, is, is free. So the accessibility is there. And then when it comes to, to, to slow fashion, yes, you, you know, I make expensive clothes, I have to disclose that, but I only make it expensive because the service and the quality that I wanted to offer was expensive. I mean, I go to the tailor and say, well, for you to use the craftsmanship that is traditional and is hand tailoring, it's gonna cost $1,000 to make a jacket. 
what am I going to tell them? I mean, these are like old Italian master tailors. Am I going to start, you know, doubting his, the, the price? It takes time. But on the other hand, is low fashion, the blueprint of it is bringing back hand sewing, local production, using your creativity into, to replace the, the, the scale of, you know, big companies. And I don't find those to be deterrents for, for less affluent communities to have access to it. I mean, you could nurture, I mean, find the, the, uh, nurture a designer in your family or in your community that could possibly do mending, which is amazing. I heard, I read that 75% of the average American doesn't wear their clothes. 75% is a lot. So you could have people in less affluent communities reaching out to clothes that are secondhand or, or you know, gently worn, maybe not even worn at all, and, and reinvented with, you know, sewing, creating something that is new and, and, and beautiful. So, yeah, that's my take on the last half. So just kind of on that note, um, you know, I think this is a, something that many designers or maybe food purveyors struggle with, particularly when you're going to market and you are showcasing a food to a more affluent market and then the idea is, oh, maybe then I'll be able to scale up and get it in a Whole Foods and then I might be able to get it in a Target or a Walmart and then it becomes a more available to the masses. And this is something that I think that a lot of people struggle with when they're trying to figure out, like, is there another way to be able to, you know, kind of get into the market and, um, and uh, reduce your costs and appeal to a consumer without doing the first affluent, first to the affluent person first, then to the rest of the market? Is, is there any kind of alternative way? Um, let me just see who I have in, in, as slides. I think, Kiki, we could go with you first. So <clears throat> this is actually my favorite way to talk about veganism because a lot of people tell me, um, well, it's true, it's about the animals for a lot of people, but it is very much about humans as well. It is a stance on human rights, a stance on cultural rights, um, for everyone to have access to the, to the same things and to be respected. And it is an absolute fact that your income, where you live, your identity directly is related to your health and what you have access to in the market. And anybody who denies that is living in the clouds. And so, for example, you brought up the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it is a fact that black women are way higher at risk for heart disease than a white woman. It is an absolute fact. And the fact that, that, it, that num those numbers are so black and white um, means that there's an issue there, right? Because it means that there's a group of people who are living on the, in this world who technically have access to the same things that everyone else does, yet their quality of life is totally different. And in, the, in many ways, ignorance is bliss, right? But when it comes to the food world, ignorance is not bliss. It is diabetes, it's sickness, it's heart disease, it's hypertension, it's losing a father at a young age because he had a heart attack. Ignorance is not bliss in the food world. And so we have to get rid of the affluent white community having access to the knowledge and get it to the root. So that means, well, A, what you brought up, the food, the food in the schools has to absolutely change. At this point in time in New York City, the average child's budget is $1.06 per lunch. And pizza is considered a vegetable as well as ketchup, which is mostly sugar. And obviously we all know that sugar is what's giving people diabetes when they get older. So we have to start with the schools. And right now there's amazing, amazing initiatives happening. There's one woman, uh, Amy Hamlish, who's started something called the Coalition for Healthy School Kids. And this is the, the initiative that's responsible for making PS 86 in Queens a vegetarian school. 
And it has totally flipped the entire culture in that school. These are public school kids. They're ki these are kids that are not coming from private school families. They, have, they should fall in that demographic of higher chances of sickness. They should be in that demographic. But in their school for eight hours a day, they're learning about food as medicine. They're learning about the connection to the farmer. They're learning how to respect the people who grow their food and it has totally shifted their entire consciousness uh, in everything. And now that consciousness has bled into so many other things. Their test scores rose. Um, they have now cut out uh, colored dyes and so there's a big connection between colored foods and ADHD. People are calmer. So we need to go into the schools and we have to go to where it really hurts the people who need it most. It's not the affluent people who need access. They're following the trends. They've got access to dietitians. They're you know, in circles where people are talking about what's hot. We need to go to the root cause, and that is going into the non-affluent communities and really talking about the children and actually the baby boomers. Children are great to talk about. They're the future, right? But the baby boomers are the largest population in the US. We can't forget about them either. My parents are baby boomers, and I am educating them on a daily basis. Hi, mom and dad. Yeah, uh, I just want to add something. The yeah. Education is just really the most important thing because there are so many preconceptions that are completely faulty. And one of them is that cheap is really expensive because at the end of the day, you are sick and you need to go to the doctor, and you're, I mean, it's all these, these you know, these horrible negative repercussions of for coming from cheap food, cheap clothes, same thing. It's, it, it's only cheap because it, it takes advantage of workers and the environment. So at the end of the day, it's actually pretty expensive. Right, because it doesn't monetize the externalities of what's happening. Exactly. I think there's like Input. a statistic out there that it's uh, like sugar-related diseases are about $1 trillion, um, has affected about $1 trillion. And then obesity, um, which is really not a d disease, it's a symptom of a diseased food system, is about $165 billion, I think, extra onto healthcare costs. I came up with States. a number, but it was smaller than that. I like your number better. Yeah, no, I, I <laughs> checked with it a big number. not too long ago. And actually, I think the $1 trillion came out of um, a recent study by Credit Suisse. But uh, the, again, the topic was a little bit more on kind of the, um, is there an alternative way to kind of move from the affluent market, marketing first to the masses? Richard? Well, I think the business model that Yasara, I think you described was, you know, a small, innovative business that then finds a way, maybe you described it, that you then sell it once it gets bigger and you need more capital because it's all about competing within the existing market. And there's no question that I understand that logic of, of growing a small business and you hope to sell it or to get greater investors, to grow larger, and you go to where the market is. Well, the market was, you know, a decade ago, was largely affluent foodies. Um, but there is a cultural shift where I think in many more communities, people see food as a mechanism to gain control, sovereignty over their own lives. So there's a real link with food sovereignty and sovereignty. So the politicization, the fact that these are political questions about the structure um, is exciting because I think we're beginning to really reframe what kind of markets can there be? Is there now a large enough market of um, low income working class people who will value food differently? Um, there is food costs and there's also time. And the time and the skills of knowing how to cook it. You know, who and when do you learn these skills? Um, so I think there are growing markets, but the problem is always overhead and access. Mm -hmm. um, and utilizing what existing markets are available to you. Whether you live in a community with churches and faith institutions, well, those are markets and beginning to develop CSAs with churches. Or as I've seen, uh, I mean, in, in your home country, in, in, in Brazil, I, I visited a fashion business incubator market where Working people were designing simple clothes to sell to working people. These kinds of mechanisms can exist if we build them, but we need to build infrastructure, social infrastructure, commercial infrastructure to meet markets that will value the quality of, that, of those foods and those goods. 
I think there's a lot of complexity with this because as um, one of the projects that I had been working on two years ago was a farm to fridge grocery delivery service and to look at if we could actually take uh, SNAP online because right now you can't take SNAP benefits online so nobody could buy food online yet a lot of food is moving online um, and, uh, and we looked at like can we get you know farm to fridge grocers can we you know appeal to uh, people who normally wouldn't have fresh food in their neighborhoods. And we did some more studies uh, on it, and we found that the only people who would technically use it are people who already use SNAP at farmer's markets. So that's where the education comes in as well, because if you're not shopping at a farmer's market, then why would you use SNAP online? Um, and, you know, obviously, the you know, you'd have to build a whole technical infrastructure, but you wouldn't want to even go to the technical infrastructure first if you didn't find that people would use it. Um, so, so I think that the education really does come in. The question is, you know, where does that education come from? Is it coming from NGOs, et cetera, et cetera? So we have a lot more questions. We're gonna try to wrap this up in like, you know, five, six, seven minutes. We could always come back, but there's some interesting questions as well here. Um, so let's keep these kind of terse as much as possible. So Moving on, I just want to give you a hot seat question, uh, Jasara. If H&M kind of came to you and said, I'm going to give you $1 million to do a line, but it's not going to be in slow fashion principles, and that's about as, as much as they paid reportedly to Carl Lagerfeld and Stella McCartney, what would you do? I wouldn't even waste much time, but I would just say no. There is absolutely no way I would engage in anything that turns out production, creates all that kind of pollution for a mere million dollars. <laughs> um, the money, it, it's re to me, it's, it's important to have accessibility for certain things, but I try to keep my life very simple where money is not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a very hard place to, uh, you know, to, to get to but it's almost like vital because how can you say how can you say and not just something or practice something in your professional or personal life that you don't believe? So I would be you know like you're saying like everybody wants to bring their company to a certain scale and then potentially sell it. I have no desire to do that actually. I mean, if anything, I mean there's always that that desire to grow, but you don't always have to grow exponentially in that way. So right now here, this is growth for me. This is growth because I'm talking to you know a, a group of people that I think will leave with certain information that they didn't know. I want to work with other educational. Um, entities and, and try to engage more students and try to fortify this idea of how I, I, I run my business and say, hey, you don't, have, you don't have to always do things that you don't want to do. I mean, all the jobs that are available for fashion students out there are usually, I mean, they want to all work for Marc Jacobs and whatever, but they're not going to get their job, so they're going to end up at H&M or, or, you know, the Uniqlo's of the world. And then a lot of them are informed that what they're doing is actually pretty, you know, they're polluting the world, they, they treat the, 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 the workers in a terrible way, and they feel so bad, but they are still in doing that. So I, I think it's it's vital to, to live by, by what you believe. In, and, and work takes too much of your time for you to abdicate the, those values and, and just go into because it, I have to make money. To me, that, that is never a good justification. Yeah. And I, I think there was a question out there about um, if somebody does have a slow fashion line, you know, if you had any thoughts of scaling, but we'll, we'll get to that later, but it's, it's related. So Jusara's point is like, you don't always have to scale and you've been in business since 1991 and you've kept your I life simple. downscale, <laughs> but I have a much better life. <laughs> um, so we're just gonna go into a little bit more of agriculture um, and growing. And uh, what type of agricultural principles are being practiced in the spirit of slow food and the slow fashion movement? Um, Kiki, do you want to start? What type of principles in the slow movement? Yeah, in slow the slow agriculture, agricultural principles. Well, I mean, this is your movement, but I guess I'll speak on it. Um, I mean, clearly we, we all agree in non-GMOs. I mean, 
taking the DNA of one species and combining it with the DNA of another species or is just absurd. And not all technology is great. And I think that we have the science and the data and the facts to back that statement up. Uh, the other thing is um, local is a huge thing. Uh, monocropping is certainly something we don't want anything to do with. It's a natural. It doesn't have anything to do with the rules of nature. And the irony in nature is that it really has no rules until you break them. And so definitely no monocropping. Uh, local as can be, no GMO, and of course the pesticides. Um, the pesticides, it's interesting, we have Monsanto. Any, has anyone here not heard of Monsanto at this point in time? We all have heard of the devil, okay. So I should watch it. He, someone, there could be a rep in here. <laughs> But, uh, you know, they have basically created crops now that can handle Roundup. And Roundup is a thing that we tell our parents in the world, do not put Roundup in your, under your sinks. Protect it from your children. But it gets sprayed on crops on a daily basis, and it's implanted in the DNA of seeds every single day. Um, so there's this massive hypocrisy going on, um, and of course it is all because it's dependent on ignorance um, and lack of transparency in our food system. And so I think non-GMO, uh, organic, local, uh, is pretty much the principles that Mother Nature intended for us, and we should just stick with it. Richard, anything to add to Kiki? Well, well maybe just th there is a shift in the thinking that is taking place on farms and in agriculture away from scale and speed and efficiency, and most importantly, extracting wealth from farms, and, and the wealth is natural wealth as well as financial wealth, and there is a growing number of farmers who are really interested in regenerative principles, of regenerating the land, that it is not this externality you don't have to think about and let other generations f deal with it, um, but that we need to plow back nutrients into the land and uh, keep resources, wealth, closer to the land. Um, this is a, a radical, transformative idea away from growth towards development. And, and, and it, it recognizes the, the sort of ecology of local economies, that we need smaller players who touch money so that there is more money circulating and, and produce and wealth and knowledge. And that's a very different model than what we inherited out of the Second World War. It was extraordinary industrialization of food that did incredible things, but at, at a cost that we hid for a very, very long time. He mentioned regenerative agriculture. What is, if we had to take a concept of regenerative fashion, which is something that um, the folks at Cradle to Cradle have used, what, what would be regenerative fashion in your mind? Take us through that process of seed all the way down to end of life. Okay, I think to me, true regenerative design or system can only really happen if you adopt what it's called a circular economic model where, okay, you extract it once, but then you produce, is there those cool slides? Yeah, you do, then you just produce something and that once is renegade like you don't want anymore for whatever reason or you wore it to, to, to tatters and you reclaim it and, and companies should have that kind of a responsibility of, of recapturing things that they, they've produced and people don't want anymore and then they get returned into yarn like they get shredded there's a you know some kind of technology that shreds these old jeans like Levi's is actually involved in, in, in one of these uh, initiatives, and they, they turn that back into yarn, that turns it back into fabric, and then you recut it, and, and it just keeps going that, like, you know, as, as a closed loop cycle, and it's similar to, in agriculture, to permaculture farming, where you take the manures, and you turn them into soils, and you produce uh, food, and you do water catchment, so everything is just like part of that circular, model. So yeah, regenerative to me would be something that you, there's absolutely zero waste uh, that comes out of the production of it. So there is an article recently called uh, Soylent, to, uh, Soylent versus Slow Food. Does everybody know what Soylent is? 
Okay, Soylent. I didn't either. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. Soylent summer. is uh, was created by a tech entrepreneur, and it's basically a sludge made out of soy and other all the nutrients that you technically need, and you could just drink it, um, which I think is really crazy because you need fiber, and it's probably only insoluble fiber in there, if anything at all. So uh, even though fiber is not considered a nutrient, but it's 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 needed. It's needed for our bodies. Yeah. So uh, so it's this kind of craze of technology. And is there this kind of like, is there a place for slow food and slow fashion in this kind of move of like technocentric world? Um, where, what role does technology play when it comes to slow food and slow fashion? I'm, I'm gonna give that to you, Kiki. So the most advanced technology we have in the world is the one that mother nature provides when it comes to food. It's a brilliant system that we're trying to mimic on a daily basis and we have failed because she's done it perfectly on her own. So in terms of technology, um, I do believe that pretty much, for example, GMO, we use it, we added vitamin D into rice, into Malaysia to try to end blindness. It had zero effect. They also told them that would high, bring higher yield, zero effect. And so we we're trying to use technology. And by the way, the, the founders of Soyland, their pitch is that it's, you know, going to be the answer to world hunger. Uh, but the irony in all of this is last year we made enough food for everybody to eat 2,500 calories a day. They love that slogan, right? That marketing. They, the they same love it. Thing, it's, the GMOs, exactly. Um, the Bayer. And, yeah. It's marketing 101. Um, you know, I studied psychology a little bit in, in, in university, and I didn't learn a thing about psychology until I took a marketing class. So, you know, it is all about psychology. And so, um, that's his Soylent pitch, and uh, I don't think that we should be making advances at all in the food industry. I think we should just uh, play by the rules of Mother Nature, and we have only started agriculture 10,000 years ago. We have millions of years of searching for berries and eating slugs and eating bugs, and our entire biometric system is based off of million of millions of years of evolution, and our bodies have not caught up to this new technology that we have started with food, which is why we are having things like colitis, Crohn's disease, diabetes, and massive Western diet illnesses, because this technology we're using in our food has nothing to do with our biology. And we have to honor that biology because it's an organic process that's just gonna happen when it wants to happen. What's, so, what's, your, what's your thoughts and take on like um, kind of the growing meat in Petri dish? I'm assuming that that's not so... It's not so vegan, is it? No. But it is vegan in mm -hmm. terms of ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's the thing. There's, there's, I, I don't remember who said this, but I think it's someone from the physicians, from Responsible Physicians Committee. Um, meat is never good for you. If eaten in small portions, at the very least, it's neutral. It's never good for you if eaten in small portions, at the very least, it's neutral. And so from a nutritional standpoint, I don't care if you eat meat. If you wanna clog your arteries, go for it. However, from an ethical standpoint, if what they're saying, what happens, biotech meat is basically they take the DNA of an animal and they grow meat in a lab. And it's got the same nutrient breakdown. It's got the same amino acids. Of course, it's, it's not filled with hormones. It's not filled with any of the chemicals and the sickness of the animal. So in that sense, it's a higher quality meat, right? Of course, it's an experiment. We'll see how it turns out 20 years from now. But from an ethical standpoint, I am totally okay with it. If, if bio meat became the rage tomorrow, I would be so excited because that means that trillions, 30 trillion animals a year, 30 trillion animals a year, which are slaughtered for 2.3 billion people, um, would not have to suffer. And so for me, I am all for it. Jusara, um, you know, I, I did a panel recently where uh, the woman from Meadows and Moore uh, was there, and so that she's recreating leather, so it's bio leather in the same form of like the meat. What do you think about that and the slow fashion kind of principles? I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to anything that's done in the lab, especially food. And then I also think that there's so much clothing out there. Like, why do they have to, like, you know, spend so much time and, and resources and funding to develop all these things? I mean, I, I went on, online and I was like, okay, spider silk made from metabolically engineered bacteria. 
whoa. And then there was like a silk jean that inserts some sort of E. coli <laughs> into the back. And then lab grown biological textiles and all of that. I mean, you know, there is a, a beautiful quote by Mahatma Gandhi. He says, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. I just think it's like, it's all these things that it's, I, I don't think that's where we should be putting our research and development, our funding. I think we really should be putting on like, how do we distribute food better? How do we distribute clothing better? I mean, there's so much waste in the food sector, right? Like, it's what, 40% of the food yeah, that's produced? Yeah, close to 40% now it's is It's crazy. So how about we start with that instead mm -hmm. of trying to figure out how to make all these bioengineer food and, mm -hmm. and bioengineer fabric? Because, I mean, fabric also comes from, from agriculture, right? Like uh, cotton and, and all that. But... Again, there's so much of it already. I feel like we just have to be creative and think about, okay, so there's all this garbage already made, so let's clean up and, and, and really use your creativity, which is, by the way, it was a gift. It's not something that you actually work too hard to, you know, to, to earn. And then hone into like, how to make something that already exists into something better. I, I'm much more into that kind of uh, thing than the so, lab. Somebody made the statement on another panel that I was at um, that said that we actually have now reached the so much extra clothing that even the third world markets will not take it anymore. Yeah. So exactly. it's actually truly going into landfill space. So from that perspective of not making more, but actually reusing and trying to figure out more of that circular exactly because then you would be tackling two problems at once the garbage and the you know the the, the, the the scarcity of natural resources which is a big problem there's a question out from the audience about how the slow food and slow fashion movements measure impact currently anybody want to take that one well in food we measure how good how good does it taste and that is of course culturally appropriate um, how clean, so how ecologically sound, and, and how fair. What is the, the dignity of the labor from field to fork measured? Um, I think, you know, we need to look through more than one lens, and I think those are a three, you know, a, a triple bottom line that, that very much works for us, which is, um, for one, reclaiming the sense that there is pleasure here that should be defended, that we something tastes good and it's valued for that. Um, and I think that speaks to the, the, the dignity of, of, of cultures that are, that are, that are, that are sidelined and trod upon. Um, and so measuring that is, of course, how you measure it. These are difficult to measure. Um, how good, how clean, and how fair. But there are measurement tools that are being developed out there to do just that. The sort of triple bottom line theory. Fashion is way behind in terms of the impact of slow fashion. I feel like I'm kind of talking to myself <laughs> most of the time. And, and also because I run a very small scale operation, I feel that I probably don't reach out as many people as I wish because of the scale. But that's not something that I want to compromise for the sake of being more visible because I think a lot of people, they kind of use that excuse and they're like, oh, we're just gonna get really big so then we can have more of an outreach, but then they end up getting absorbed by the same kind of, uh, you know, wrong doing so because once you get to that scale it's kind of hard to back up so i just rather just stay the way i am i try to have as much impact as i, I possibly can within my small operation and and things like forms like this i think are very helpful and um, and i think the the way that we are I'm planning to engage further with educational institutions i think that would actually spring into something much more broad and so I'm sort of excited about it but yeah we're here because we're we're behind <laughs> the, the, the food sector in terms of, of a movement but um, but there's so much that we we learn from it from the you know from this little food movement yeah and I think from the fashion industry in general though it's not considered necessarily slow fashion the more universal way of looking at sustainability and environmental impacts is through a group called um, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. They use the HIG index, and they're looking at like land use and material, uh, material re reclamation, materi types of materials, 
um, a number of different lenses, chemistry. But again, that's in the context of kind of like larger scale fashion. So in a way, you know, slow fashion is, may not even need measurement tools from the standpoint of like it, it, it's almost, you would say, at the complete antithesis or at the complete opposite end of it. Um, so there's a question here on, uh, a couple of questions here, really on the cost. And we, I know we discussed a little bit about this, but um, I'll read both of the questions. And if anybody wants to jump in on it, what is some advice that you would give to someone interested in being a much more conscious consumer on a budget, whether it is food or fashion, and to uh, eat well, it costs a lot of money in the city. You know, you could go to Whole Foods, which I know some people call Whole Paycheck, and, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more on the high price. So what are some creative, innovative ideas for somebody who's on a budget, food or fashion? Anybody could take it. Sorry? Sales and coupons. You can get 10 bananas for a dollar. What's that? You can get 10 bananas for a dollar. Buying in bulk? Yeah. Buying in bulk. <laughs> Got to like beans. Make those beans. I bought a bunch of white beans and it was like $2.38 for like two pounds. It's crazy. That, whole, yeah, uh, they'll whole foods. feed you. Yeah, they'll feed yeah. you for a whole week. In Brazil, that's what we eat. Makes rice you and fart beans for a whole week too. <laughs> I think in, with clothing, I, I go back to secondhand clothing. There, I, I used to shop secondhand and I... I love because it gives you a certain sense of individuality, which I pretty much compare to biodiversity in agriculture. You come out of it with clothes that not everybody has. And I never understood. I mean, the marketing and the psychology that goes into these campaigns that make people want to wear what's in the magazine, to wear a logo. I'm like, they got to pay me to wear a logo. <laughs> You know, it's like it makes no sense whatsoever, and they pay so much money. So it's like the, the marketing psychology that they use is just really effective. But secondhand clothing, and then you can mend it. Like you know, if it's something's a little out of out of shape, or or if it just looks a little, you know, 1990s, you just take out the shoulder pads, you know, like and do things like that, and you can come out of it so. Cool. And just a statement that you made there. Um, back in the 1600s, I think was when the first label was put into a clothes, and there, that whole idea of I want to wear what the king and queen is wearing um, really stemmed out of that era, and, it, it, and we haven't really gotten away from the behavioral shift, so I think that there's always great, an, a great opportunity to look at fashion with fresh eyes and question everything, um, you know, from that standpoint, and, um, and be a little bit more hypercritical. Just don't accept what you see and be able to, I think that's where some of the most innovative businesses and ideas actually come out of. Kiki, I know you were jumping at the bit there. Well, I, I think I have a unique perspective here because I have not, well, I guess you do too. You're not in the fashion world either. <laughs> but uh, I'm strictly consumer. Um, and I have sort of had that behavioral shift. I don't shop very often and I don't gain weight. So I don't really have to shop very often. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I shop maybe once every two years and it's... Like I have to be going somewhere to go shopping or have, or I'm a shortage of something. But I remember when I was in high school, I had a teacher who would make a joke because she would wear new shoes every day and she, her husband would make jokes about how she would hide in the closet because he would hear the, the, the pay less, uh, the, the price tags being pulled off. And I said, what is it, you know, what is it about her mind that makes her feel like she has to shop every weekend? Why is that fulfilling to her? And we were talking earlier about how what the moment we got rid of so many things in our lives, like there was just this massive weight of like, ah, oh, I don't have stuff to trek around. So I think part of it is you can save money by not spending money. And then of course, I, only, I try to only buy used clothing and you know, it does add a sense of individuality. You, you know, I tell stories, I'm like, I wonder who had these shoes before me? <laughs> so I think that's two really great ways. Uh, Richard, do you want to say anything? Just quickly, beans and rice, beans and rice. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> and potlucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, eat less often on your own and, and cook with others. Um, your life becomes so much more interesting. You learn so much more. That's great. And then uh, just, I just want to kind of finish up. I mean, there are so many other questions, but just because we came off of a very harrowing um, political atmosphere and everybody's tired of it, but I really want to get a sense of how politics plays a role in kind of the, at least like what, 
what's next? What's to come? How how does politics play a role when we in in now in the food in the food world? I saw some of the new policies that um, Trump is going to put forth, not directly to food, not directly to apparel, but it gives us an indication of kind of where we're heading, and um, and just. I'd love for somebody to give me some insights into this at all. <laughs> Bueller, Bueller. Still shell shock? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I do think there is a craving, and, and it has a policy impact, a craving for social cohesion. And food is one of those bridges that can help to build bridges between urban and rural and supply and demand. But you have to invest in that. You have to invest in those bridges to exist for one. The other that is, you know, sort of the, the trying to find the silver lining in a very dark cloud, the political discourse that has resonated in the last few months and certainly this past week does get to the core of what is our social contract? What is our obligation to each other and the wages that we pay people to produce the things that we consume on a regular basis? And the, the social contract that has sort of unraveled, is falling apart around us, says that it's okay for, for food to be cheap because it is cheap on the backs of immigrant labor who, who farm and who harvest it. And the fact that we're having a discussion nationally, and maybe a sort of distorted one, but one about um, what is a national economy in a global world um, is an interesting jumping off point and I think it's especially important for food, which has become globalized, um, textiles and fashion, which is globalized, is where are the barricades to build dignity um, between supply and demand and the decisions we make as consumers and producers? And, and how can we begin to create a world where, in an economy, where we're not just consumers, but we're protagonists in our lives and we have control and the ability to shape the world that may look very different. There are so many glimmers of this alternative economy around, especially you see around food. Um, but it, it takes um, some kind of consensus, whether it's regional or national. And what I hear is there is no national consensus and therefore no policies that are really supporting this. Yeah. Well, like you said, there really is no policy. And uh, if we're talking governmental politics primarily, um, you know, there's, as a person who is against an, uh, animal use of any sort, especially in the food system, um, we may look different, we may talk differently, but the whole world is talking about sustainability because that's something that affects us all. It's a problem for every human on the planet. And so we are all talking about food. And in our own political system, there is no broccoli lobby, unfortunately. Right, specialty There's produce. <laughs> specialty produce, if you get this, is, um, is tree nuts, fruits, and vegetables. It's about 1% of our land. Um, but we have lobbies for corn and soy, which primarily goes to corn, animal feed. Corn, soy, dairy, and beef yeah. for the four or, largest food lobbies. Or it goes lobbies. into cars for the, the corn. Um, um, but there's no specialty food lobby <laughs> out there. There isn't. There's uh, and things would be very different it wouldn't, wouldn't it be if we did have a broccoli lobby? Um, and in terms of politics as a whole, not just governmental politics, um, you know, we also have to, as consumers, take charge of what we're how we're voting with our money. And the consumer is very powerful. The same companies that put bovine growth hormone in our milk do not put bovine growth hormone in uh, the milk that they ship out to Australia because the consumers won't buy it. Same company, two different, completely different systems. So as consumers, we have the power to shift that supply and demand. The second thing is we also have to start paying attention to the behind the scenes stuff. And that is in terms of our political politics in terms of who's paying who. You know, the USDA is paying for the majority of subsidized medical textbooks. I'm sorry, not the USDA. The dairy industry is actually subsidizing most of the USDA salaries. This is something that most people don't know unless you're a hippie like me and you go to all these weirdo talks. But it's true and it's something that we don't talk about. And then of course the dairy industry is subsidizing medical school te textbooks. So that in a sense is politics and who is really moving the chess pieces. Uh, so we, I think the most powerful thing that we can make in terms of politics is shift how we vote with our money. And that in and in, in, in as a result will shift how the behind the scenes politics work. 
Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I think boycotting is, I mean, it's something <laughs> like a movement from the, I don't know, the seven, but it's really powerful. And as, as, as a, a society, if we stop buying products from Nestle or, you know, anything that has to do with plastic, I mean, really fight with passion everything that is plastic wrapped or plastic, this, we actually, it's not a vital need. If it were like water or anything like that, I'm like, okay, we're screwed, but, and we will be <laughs> very soon, but there are so much of the, 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 the things that are polluting the, the, the world, the, the water streams, and then in return, it, it coming back to our food, that we can avoid, and it's not gonna make you less happy, it's not going to have a big impact at all, like if you don't have that plastic coffee with a plastic straw, every day, just go with your own cup. It's, it actually tastes a lot better. Mm -hmm. So things like that, you know, just to have that consciousness and, and really with, you know, I mean, I, I do that with, with, with more passion than the average, I suppose, but then there are people that I do even more. I mean, there's that girl, Trash Lauren, for Tossers, yeah. Lars. she's the cutest girl. She came to visit and she has accumulated all the garbage that is not compostable nor biodegradable in a little mason jar. <laughs> For the past four years. Four years, because I thought it was one year and I was already impressed. She's like, no, this is four. I'm like, wow. But, you know, you do what you can, but as long as you do it, and, and you know, because then the industry will be like, all right, they're not buying my product, I wonder why. And the, the, at the end of the day, they're all in business to make money, and that's why they lie, and they, they are deceitful. So if you actually go behind the scenes and you learn how there are all these conflicts of interest, there are all these things that are, you know, they say that are not true, and, and you boycott or you write to them and say, hey, I like your product, but do you think you could, I, I'm not buying it anymore because it, it's all wrapped in this plastic that I can't, I, I can't recycle. And if they keep hearing things like that, they will actually make a change because they want to sell their product. Uh, I want to get your final thoughts, but just one, one more question that audience, the audience had is like, is, can you scale up? There is this kind of idea of like, can you scale up when you do slow food or fashion? Um, it, you know, is there that possibility? Is it not, maybe is there more like model that could be replicable or is there, do we just have this fascination with scale? And if you do want to scale, is there that the, the possibility to do that? Well, there's definitely a fascination for scale that I think is sort of embedded in our culture in the United States, that you just have to exponentially grow your business, and, and which makes no sense to me, but whatever. So the thing is, it, it makes it people, like players like me, be kind of out of sight because they don't even care about small companies if you don't show that there is a huge potential for growth. So I actually scratched my head and thought, okay, I have to be smart and, and think about how this can be scalable. And I think that, again, the only way I would engage in some kind of, of uh, production in, in a larger scale and, and churn out production is if, it's, if it, it adopts this circular economical business model where there is no waste. And you could do that. You could do that in a much larger scale than is being done right now, where you take all this surplus and there's so much of it, and there are companies that are with technology, and this is where technology actually plays a, a positive role. They sort all these post-consumer clothing and the into fiber categories so that they can actually do things with it and turn them into fabric again. And then you can produce clothing that are different, that are maybe trendier or of the moment, and then you just keep doing it that way. So to me, that would be the only way that it could be justifiable to be on a, you know, to, to be scalable. But that is a solution. <laughs> Food businesses? Well, I think we don't know. There are many large companies that are trying to embrace um, many of the values that we care about. Um, and whether it's animal welfare or sustainable practices or cleaning up menus with less junk, um, the, there are things happening that are very exciting, very encouraging, um, and they're being done at a scale that would certainly fit into the industrial grid. Um, 
But what are they actually looking at, these larger companies? They're looking at the smaller companies that are like kicking ass. They're the ones that are like setting the world on fire because they're authentic, they're original, um, and they're, they're not making the compromises. Because every time you get larger, you're going to have to make compromises. Um, because you're going to need regular supply. And you just have to figure out what is your comfort level with what compromises you're going to make in order to fill the niche of the market that you think you can find. Um, but I'm always reminded of the farmers I worked with for many, many, many years ago. Medium-sized farmers were always the most interesting to talk to because they used to look at the bigger farmers near them. This is in South Louisiana. And they'd say, oh, one of these days, I want to be like them. And what started to happen with the farm to restaurant, farm to table phenomena, the growth of farmers markets, these new markets that opened up, is those medium-sized farmers started to look at the small farmers and say, they have a better quality of life than I do. And actually, I'd rather get smaller and smarter and increase the quality of life and um, uh, rather than just the volume and become capitalized. Because the more capitalized you are, the more vulnerable you are to shifts. So I think be nimble rather than necessarily big. It was really interesting because I spoke with Rick Ridgway, uh, who's you know part of um, Patagonia. Maybe this was like two weeks ago. And uh, I don't know if you know, but they also started a food business recently, Patagonia Provisions. And um, you know they, they're a little bit more nimble in the industry because they never took shareholder money. And really, and you never did either. So it's, it's, uh, you can be more nimble when you don't take a check. Because if you take a check from somebody, you have to actually pick up the phone when they call you. Um, so you know, he, what was interesting for him is he said that in 10 years' time, he thinks that Patagonia's food business is going to exceed, uh, in probably less than 10 years' time, Patagonia's food business is going to exceed their fashion business, which I thought was really interesting because their fashion business has been around for, for decades. So uh, we're going to bring this to an end, but I want to get final thoughts from all of you. I mean, I've heard a lot of um, topics. We didn't really get into like half of them, but we don't have the time any longer, so c'est la vie. But uh, any fun, kind of final thoughts um, for this audience, which I would assume is probably mostly fashion, but probably some food as well. You guys can go first. I'll look through my notes to see if I miss anything that's really important. I, I think just to, to resist the idea um, that food or fashion is utility. And, and I think the more that we own it as protagonists that, are, that say something about our lives and our values, um, I think the happier we are. And, I, and I, I, I think this is the shift that is taking place as we, 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 we sort of leave the 20th century behind, is we do not need to be dutiful consumer units. And then we can be protagonists in our own lives and define what's important to us. And I think these are very outward facing things. The, the food we eat and the clothes we wear do, do make statements. Um, I think we can overstate how strong of a statement they are, but they are acute decisions that change people around you. Kiki? Um, I'll close with one of my favorite metaphors, and it is the running and overflowing sink metaphor. And the overflowing sink is basically a result of our bad habits. Yeah, our bad habits of buying too much, eating too much, buying unnecessarily without knowing where it came from is causing an overflowing sink, and that overflowing sink of problems is a dying planet, is lots of people suffering, is uh, causing a very big imbalance in wealth and uh, resources available to certain people. And so as people, logically, instead of just taking a towel and wiping up the sides of those of that overflowing sink and pretending like the sink isn't running, the logical thing to do is just turn off that sink. And so we need to change our habits, we need to turn off the sink, and we need to figure out how we can make this planet livable for the people that are being born today and need to occupy this planet for the next 100 years. And so the best thing that we can do as consumers is for fashion and food is to educate yourself. And there's a wealth of knowledge out there and people who are really carrying white flags. And it's all on YouTube, it's on Netflix. And so just go immerse yourself in documentaries and uh, become the protagonist of your own story. And thank you for coming today. Yeah, you, I think that's really important also to 
really try to circumvent all these false information that come our way. They bombard us with misconceptions and things that make you think that you are doing something, I mean, they are doing something right, and it's just completely the opposite of it. So information is so important. Documentaries are amazing. And, uh, and then I think just to give a very simple tip on how to be engaged in this world where we live that there's so much pollution is when you look at your garbage, just remember that <laughs> it doesn't disappear by magic. <laughs> What you throw in your garbage is going to go somewhere. So consume less, consume responsibly, whatever you touch. Just remember that if it's going to be, you know, end up in the garbage, it's because it's going to pollute. So, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to do one, like, some quick actionable takeaways. So for, for me, uh, and I think I heard Jusara said this as well, um, I think that we have to do more than vote. Uh, we all casted our vote, but I think we have to do more than vote. You know, it's true yesterday as it, as it is today. But, uh, you know, I wanted so badly to get curbside organics pickup in my neighborhood here. And I called my friend to say, what can I possibly do to get that done? He's like, why don't you just go to door to door and get some signatures? So I went to the parks. I went door to door. I met my neighbors for the first time. It was kind of awesome. Um, and then I went to my, my assemblyman, which, you know, he lives or his office is like four blocks away from me. He has a cat that sit, sits on his desk. He wears a suit like two sizes too big for him, but he's the awesomest guy and he represents, um, you know, what you want in your, your town or your community. And um, he arranged the meeting with the DOS, Department of Sanitation, and uh, I was like, listen, I'm a little jealous. There's curbside organics pickup in Greenpoint. It's not in Williamsburg. And, he, you know, he just made it happen. I get, ended up talking to the DOS. I ended up getting a number of um, buildings on board. And, uh, and then we're, they're rolling out, you know, uh, everything in my neighborhood in 2017. And then the all, like, all of New York will have uh, curbside organics pickup, which was going to happen anyway by 2018. And it, it's, but it's, it, you know, they were so thankful that somebody came and to their door and asked for something. And I think most of us, feel like we're helpless and hopeless. And there's this opportunity for us to actually stand up and to get our voice heard a little bit more. The same thing from, from what you said on the sense of uh, boycotting, um, being more proactive, uh, giving yourself a challenge every day. Um, I just got a vermicomposter maybe like uh, uh, six or seven months ago. So it's like a, I feed worms my compost. And um, the idea of just kind of taking care of them and, and seeing the satisfaction of actually getting your compost in there. I mean, th these are just like things that, you know, we could do and, and then you feel a little bit better about yourself. Maybe, maybe, you're an, maybe you're an omnivore and you're like, you know, screw Meatless Monday, that's only one day a week. Maybe I just go meat only on Monday. And then you give yourself a challenge, you see how you feel, you, you, you analyze how your body is, do you feel better, do you feel worse? And you just make those changes in your life and then and also those changes in the community that you want to see um, you'll be shocked at the benefits that you get from it like even meeting my meeting my neighbor i realized that my street on the other side um, my street is really awesome in williamsburg and i realized it was because of my neighbor bob beswick who literally has lived there for 40 years and chooses selectively what businesses he wants to see there so we have like a plant shop we have a slow fashion jewelry designer. We have an acupuncturist who I just found out that it was there. It was just on the second floor of this building. And you begin to realize that every single individual makes an impact in their community in some kind of way. And for me, I'm like, he's a local hero because he's made my quality of life better because he's made those decisions. Um, and, uh, and not just a landlord who's like looking to get the next Chipotle or, or anything else in. So we all have those options. Maybe we don't own real estate, but we do own clothes, and we are, um, you, we might be a designer that's coming out there, we might be a food purveyor, and I think that those little changes really can make a difference. Thank you guys for today. I'm sure we're going to stick you. around, so if anybody has any other questions, feel free to come up to the stage. Thanks.